Anti-Fragile. This book is about how things benefit from disorder. It's written by Lebanese-American essayist and former options trader Nassim Nicholas Taleb. His only other book that I have is The Black Swan, and if you've seen my review of The Black Swan, you know that this man likes to break everything down and build himself up only to break everything down again, including himself, whether that's built up entirely or not. I just think the way he brags about himself is hilarious. Anti-fragile basically means that you are sexually attracted to violence. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that has nothing to do with this. <laughs> it means that you actually benefit from unfather... unfather... I tried to say unfathomable and unfavorable, but unfathomable also has nothing to do with this. It has, it means that you benefit from unfavorable circumstances. Like being dumb and anti-fragile is easily preferable to being smart and fragile any day. The author proposes that for decades now, and decades we have tinkered our way toward a collective state of societal, economic, psychological, and spiritual fragility. It's really difficult, I've found, to listen to audiobooks that are written by this guy and not have some sort of a strong emotional reaction to them. So in this book, there are seven books. I don't know why they're called... I don't know why they're not called chapters. There are seven books in this book, and let's just super briefly go over which what which one is and what it's about. Book one is about the trade-off between the anti-fragility of a person and the anti-fragility of a group of people. Book two is about the dynamics of this state of anti-fragility. Book three reintroduces a friend for, of ours from the Black Swan. His name is Fat Tommy. As well as an intuitive understanding of anti-fragility. Book 4 talks about this certain asymmetry behind things in the world. Book 5 is... I, I don't even know what Book 5 is about, honestly. I don't even know if the author knows what it's about. Book 6 is about the positive and negative effects of what's called convexity. And Book 7 is about the ethics behind anti-fragility. So, I don't know, a little bit of this guy's stuff is kind of confusing. I don't know if it's just very advanced stuff, or he tries to make it seem that way, or both. But what's in this book seems a lot more clear than what's in the Black Swan. However, a lot of behind-the-scene Black Swan dynamics are kind of revisited here and explained the places like Mediocristan and Extremistan, and of course characters like Fat Tony. What's weird about anti-fragility is that nature is anti-fragile, but people ourselves, we are not. Because we constantly take from each other and ourselves at our own expenses. For every small mistake, mistake that we avoid, there's a bigger mistake that's coming our way that's only getting bigger. This book explains why caring about things statistically makes them worse, and how that makes them better, and how that is inevitable. The only problem is that the things that get better actually make things worse for things that are just doing their thing. He also talks a lot about loss aversion and how to kind of hack our biology to get better results out of the different risks that we take. This chapter obviously involved one of my favorite philosophies that I've learned about over the years, stoicism. I found Black Swan rather snobby. Uh, I think this book is a lot more maturely written than Black Swan. Conceptually, I think they both have in common the internal and external presentations of how an idea can apply to us. In other words, look, this applies to you and the world around you, and here's why we should stop running from it and pretending that it doesn't really exist. And I noticed that, you know, it's easy to say that this book is just about how things benefit from disorder, <laughs> but it's kind of difficult to explain it any less briefly than that. I mean, you could just look at the list of the, the chapter or section names, like the inverse turkey problem, or if it's Wednesday, I must be vegan. Not to mention the ones that come off as tutorials, like how to argue in an emergency room, or how to deal with soccer moms, or how to lose a grandmother, and maybe even understand that. If you have to even kind of explain what any of those things are about, it doesn't really seem like you can do it without unpackaging a whole maximalist lecture on a multitude of things, from probability and functions to convexity, and why Harvard and Wharton professors are really not actually that smart. Oh, and also epistemology, and intellectual fallacies, and barbells, and robustifications of ancient Greek philosophy. Like, I've been told <laughs> that I overthink things. But this is just 
If you want to tell me I overthink things, I look up to people like this guy, okay? This part stood out in book six, in a part talking about neomania, the love of new things for their own sake. Tonight, I will be meeting friends at a restaurant, one of what has been existed for th at least 25 centuries. I will be walking there wearing shoes hardly different from those worn 5,300 years ago by the mummified man discovered in the glacier in the Austrian Alps. At the restaurant, I will be using silverware, a Mesopotamian technology which qualifies as a killer application, given what it is allows me to do to the leg of a lamb, not just tear it apart while sparing my fingers from burn. I will be drinking wine, a liquid that has been in use for at least six millennia. The wine will be poured into glasses, an innovation claimed by my Lebanese compatriots to come from their Venetian ancestors. And if you disagree about the source, we can say that glass objects have been sold by them as trinkets for at least 2,900 years. After the main course, I will have a somewhat younger technology, artisanal cheese, paying higher prices for those that have not changed in their preparation for several centuries. Had someone in 1950 predicted such a minor gathering, he would have imagined something quite different. So thank goodness I will not be dressed in a synthetic shiny space-style suit, consuming nutritionally optimized pills while communicating with my dinner peers by means of screens. The dinner partners in turn will be expelling airborne germs on my face as they will not be located in the human colonies across the galaxy. The food will be prepared using a very archaic technology, fire with the air of kitchen tools and implements that have not changed since the Romans except in the quality of the metals used. I will be sitting on an at least 3,000 year old device commonly known as the chair, which will be, if anything, less ornate than its Egyptian ancestor. And I will not be repairing for the restaurant with any aid of a flying motorcycle. I will be walking, or if late, using a cab by a century old technology driven by an immigrant. This part also stood out on the topic of smoking, riding under the wing of medication and healthcare and stuff like that, which is a series of subject the subjects that the author repeatedly seems to have a bone to pick with throughout the book. The harmful effects of smoking are roughly equivalent to the good ones of every medical intervention developed since the war. Getting rid of smoking provides more benefit than being able to cure people of every possible type of cancer. In conclusion to the summary, I want to say that the epilogue is epic, <laughs> okay? The only other book of his, that I, in case that's not obvious, that I have listened to is The Black Swan. So I'm gonna compare the negative reviews of this to the negative reviews of Black Swan and say that they say a lot of the same stuff, there are just a lot less of them. And I'm pretty sure there are way more reviews of this book overall than there are of Black Swan. As far as the whole arrogance thing, maybe there should be some sort of a way to warn potential readers other than negative reviews of these things and explain that perhaps arrogance on the part of any author is an acquired taste. Grant Cardone, a hero of mine, is constantly like gnawed at over his supposed arrogance, but a lot of people who look up to him, like myself, have kind of gotten used to it. But as far as Nassim Taleb, who is like nothing like Grant Cardone, especially in this aspect, I just don't think I can see how a man who preaches that no one ever will ever know everything that there is ever could really come off to others as a man who is convinced that he knows everything. But again, maybe the way I, he brags about himself is just hilarious to me. The self-presentation of this book, it's like, it balances itself out. It's not that good, but it's really not that bad. The uniqueness of concept is, it's fantastic, I'll put it that way. The organization, this guy started, okay, this guy started his Google talk about his most recent book, Skin in the Game, by talking about how he tries to organize his books similarly to how nature organizes fractals. And a lot of people said that Black Swan, like 75% of that book wasn't really necessary. People also said that about this book, but I heard a lot less stuff that I felt the book really needed to say to fully get its point across. Maybe that's just how grandiose I seem to find the concept of anti-fragility. Maybe the black swan just wasn't as prepared for itself. Quotes, even immortality can kill you. I can instantly tell if someone is a banker with minimal cues as I have physical allergies to them, even affecting my breathing. Necessity really is the mother of invention. It's much easier to sell, look what I did for you, than look what I avoided for you. The sea gets deeper the further you go into it. It is hard to stick to a discipline of mental write-off when things are going well, yet that's when one needs that discipline the most. Wealth is the slave of the wise man and the 
master of the fool. If the student is smart, the teacher takes the credit. The cause of death is making enemies and the cure is making friends. We practitioners and quants aren't too phased by remarks on the part of academics. It would be like prostitutes listening to technical commentary by nuns. These laws of physics are so universal that they even work in Russia. If those who don't want hyped up prepackaged 18 minute lectures on the web paid attention to people in their teens and 20s who do, and in whom the key to the supposed future lies, they would be thinking differently. If all medications were dumped into the sea, it would be far better for mankind and far worse for the fish. Never trust the words of a man who is not free. Direction one. I recommend this book if you find yourself looking up to long-term thinkers and wondering, how can I think more long-term about things? I swear that you can get this book and read it or listen to it over and over and over and over again and just constantly <laughs> never stop learning new things. That's something else about this guy. A lot of people will trash his supposed arrogance, but nobody in any review said that he's stupid and nobody in any review said that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Direction two, if you like this book, you this is such a unique book. I don't even know. You might like Titan, the John D. Rockefeller senior bio by Ron Cherno. Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. There's a link in the description if you guys want to check it out. There's a link to that and all the other books that I mentioned in this video. If there are any other books that you guys want me to check out and review, please let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if you checked out this book and you liked it. But hey, make sure to smash that like button if you haven't already for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't already. I don't know why people watch this far into my videos and they don't subscribe. And if you subscribe, but you want to take it up just a notch and turn on the notification bell to receive a notification every time I drop a new video, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can find me everywhere, and I will see you then.